It's a real privilege to be here and to deliver this presentation to you on the resource uh, recovery and reuse, how it can be, um, how we can take that as an opportunity to address some of the issues that we see in the urbanizing areas. What we have been talking about in terms of resource competition, in terms of degradation. So this is what I'll be talking about today. We all know what the issues with urbanization are. We have heard about that during the conference. We know that over 50% of the population is living in the urban areas. We know that um, this, of course, all of us, we are very familiar with that. We are living in cities, we are traveling from cities, so we know what the issues are. And um, in the cities, one main issue that I want to highlight today is that those cities are usually very densely populated. When we talk of cities, 50% of the population, over 50% of the population is living on between 2 to 3% of the footprint of the planet. So there is a concentration living here. And because of that concentration, we see that cities become like a sink for natural resources. They demand a lot of water, they demand a lot of food. And in order to sustain the livelihoods of the people who are living in the cities, we have to, you know, there, there are some... Uh, areas around the cities that are being cropped in order to sustain and provide all the vegetables that the cities need in the peri-urban peri areas. And this represents over 20% of all the agricultural land that is being farmed in, uh, around the world. And this is where the issue is, how to make this sustainable, how to make sure that we are not generating more risk, you know, for the people who are living in the cities. And there is another issue with the cities. One other issue is the management of the waste. And we have two types of waste that exist. Of course, we have the post-harvest waste. That represents about 30% of all the waste, um, of all the food that is being produced. That means that about 30% of the food that we have produced, we are not consuming it. It goes to waste. And we invest water, we invest nutrients in order to be able to obtain these products. And by the end of the day, we don't use this product and we waste that. So it's a very big issue. This is not only a loss in terms of money, but it's also a loss and a misuse of the resources that we have. This, um, the amount of water that is being used actually to farm this, uh, these products that actually are never going to be put, to, that are never going to be used, represent the runoff of uh, a very famous river that we have in West Africa, the Volta River, which has a runoff of around 250 kilometer cube, which represents a huge amount of water. So we have those losses, important losses of, nutri of uh, nutrients, water, food, but we also have, you know, all the issues with the post-consumption waste. So when we generate the waste, um, we have to manage the waste, and the waste decomposes, it releases greenhouse gases, and this is contributing again to the climate change. So this is another issue. Um, this, if we have to, we can look at, visualize the food waste has, um, has a country, you know, if we can visualize it as a country. The amount of greenhouse gas emissions that are being released from that source alone would be the third emitter in the world. So after the United States and also China. So this represents quite an important challenge and something that we need to address in the urban areas. Um, the management of the waste brings a certain number of issues in the urban areas. One of them is that it puts a lot of pressure on the natural resources. If I take the case of the water, for example, the water, um, there is a, quite some demand for water. So water for, uh, for drinking purposes, water for industrial purposes, and then we have water that is also needed for agriculture. And bec because the demand for agriculture uh, is most, most important, and uh, um, I would say, the issue is that farmers will have to rely on sources that are not safe, uh, contaminated by the waste that we have produced in the cities. So if we look at the wastewater, in, for instance, this is a photo that shows um, a, a, like one area in, in a developing country. And you see the wastewater that is being channeled through a drain. And that wastewater is being used directly 
to grow some vegetables that are going to be eaten subsequently in the cities. And that waste water, of course, is not safe. And the crops that are being grown sometimes have to be eaten raw, which poses a very significant issue. And this is the kind of things that we want to avoid. We want to put in place uh, safe resource recovery and reuse, that we can make sure that there is more water available for use in the urban areas, uh, that we do not put too much pressure, you know, trying to source new um, clean water from, you know, maybe underground or other sources, surface, surface water, and that we make sure that there is enough resources for everybody to use. And being successful in the resource recovery and reuse actually is going to bring a certain number of benefits. One of them, of course, will allow safe intensification of agriculture, safe and also sustainable. Safe because we are this time using water that is of good quality, and also we have, you know that in the wastewater there are some nutrients that are present, so the nutrients can also become available for agriculture, and this is a way of recycling the nutrients. And this is also essential for environmental protection. Uh, this photo here is what we don't want to see. We don't want to see the waste anyhow in the environment, but we want to see it well managed, well controlled, and um, this will avoid issues, you know, of eutrophication, will avoid, you know, issues of decomposition and so on. So, to be able to do that, as I mentioned, resource recovery and reuse, that we call in short RRR, is very essential. And being successful in achieving that is not only going to be useful uh, for the cities, but it will also help us achieve several sustainable development goals. If I take the example of goal six, goal six actually targets directly the recycling and the reuse of the water and other waste. So, if we are successful in RRR, we'll also be able to achieve that goal. And many more goals are also going to be affected. We are talking of goal 11, which is looking at making cities more resilient, more safe also. Uh, we are talking also of ensuring sustainable consumption for goal 12, climate change, goal 13, and so on. So there will be you know, a lot of advantages if we are able to put in place these kind of measures for the safe recovery and reuse of all the waste that is being generated in urban areas. What is the potential of that waste? What kind of amount you know, are we talking about? That is what I will be focusing on. We already know the potential with the manure. The animal waste is already being used especially in the rural areas to you know, uh, supply a certain number of nutrients and also organic matter. This is already being done. Uh, what is lacking is that for now, the potential in the urban areas, the waste that is being generated in the urban areas so far is not yet being used at its maximum potential. There is a lot of potential in using the municipal solid waste and also the human excreta. And here we are talking of over one billion tons of year of compost that can become available from these sources if this is done in a safe way. But to be able to achieve that, we also need to put in place uh, models, business models that will be sustainable, that will be able to respond to this need. And this is where the challenge is, because setting up these business models so far have not been an easy task. There are a certain number of challenges to that, and I have mentioned some of them here. One of them is that most of these initiatives, when you see them in countries, they are mostly um, at a pilot scale, small scale, and they are heavily dependent on subsidies, which is not a sustainable model. So because of that, um, we don't see, you know, in many countries, we don't see these kind of business models being operated and running and being successful. And when we don't have enough cost recovery, it's very difficult to convince any person to adopt such a, such a system or such a technology. So the cost recovery is extremely important, and that has to be assured by through the sales of the product or through some financing mechanisms that are sustainable and not only dependent on subsidies. Another issue that is also common to many more sectors is the fact that we don't always have technologies that are adapted to the local context. That is another issue. We need low-cost technologies. Uh, there are technologies that work in some countries, but they are not necessarily applicable in the developing world because of the capacity, uh, the skills that are limited. So there is still a need to work on technologies that are really, uh, that can match the capacity in the local context. Another issue is the health risk. Um, when we are 
dealing with municipal solid waste, we may have other contaminants. So we have to deal with that. And more and more with all kinds of, even the animal waste, we are more and more talking of emerging contaminants. So these are issues that we need to address because we are not too sure yet what the impact of those ones could be on the products that we are using. So there is need for research to address those issues and clarify what the opportunities are. And also some stigma issue, especially when you are trying to recycle fecal sludge excreta there are sometimes, in so many, many areas, there may be some resistance in the use of this kind of material. Other issue I will mention is the policy. And the policy, I have heard all through the conference, many issues with policies in many countries. So there is need for suitable policies that are going to support these kind of initiatives. But because there is not so, we don't have so many cases that are successful, it's very difficult to also bring the policy to, to support the, the, the implementation of these businesses at country levels and at city, city, city levels. And then finally, one issue is the limited capacity. The capacity of the people to take up these kind of initiatives, the capacity also, technical capacity to respond to the opportunities that we have here. And this is the conceptual approach that I am proposing to address this kind of issue. How to make resource recovery and reuse become uh, attractive to the cities, attractive to um, all kinds of stakeholders so that it can be adopted, so that we can address all the issues that I have mentioned earlier. First of all, I think there is need for fundamental research, and that is going to be done by universities, um, by all kind, All the research community has to engage in that. We need to respond to some basic questions, uh, like what is, the, what is the demand for the market? You know, what, what are the requirements in the market? What kind of technology can be used? to address this kind of issue. Can we also think of you know, models, conceptualized models that can be implemented in order to respond to this, uh, this need? So this is one thing that I think is extremely important. Another thing I think that will be essential is after we have generated that, it will be important to test, test these business models at scale. Testing it at scale, linking with the municipalities, linking with the private sector, and demonstrating, not at a pilot scale, but really larger scale, demonstrating that these initiatives are viable, are interesting. Um, and if we look at it also there, um, we need to demonstrate what the benefits are for this kind of investment, resource recovery and reuse. What are the benefits for the environment? Can we quantify them for the society? Can we measure them so that we can easily see and we can easily prove and demonstrate to all the stakeholders that this is something that is of relevance and should be, uh, that we should pursue. Um, after we have demonstrated that, I think this is the time we will be in a good position really to bring the policy in and to make sure that um, they, they, they bring, they, they buy in, you know, and they, they create the enabling environment for the scaling out and the scaling up of all these initiatives. And at that point also, I think it will be important to build in the knowledge of the implementation into the curriculum of several schools so that the practitioners that are going to work on the ground would have the knowledge that is needed to make sure that the scaling out and the scaling up efforts are, are being achieved successfully. Um, let me give you an example, an example of this kind of model that we are trying to implement. This example is taken from a Ghana, a case that is being implemented in Ghana right now. And the idea, the reason why the project was started was really to understand why uh, or how we can really proceed to sustain the operation of the treatment plants, especially the fecal sludge treatment plants. In many countries, they are not working well, and one key reason is that there is no continuous flow of money that allows the public entities, mostly in charge of the waste management, that allows them to really continuously operate and maintain the system. So the model that we are proposing here is really to try to make sure that there is a continuous flow of money that enables them continuously to, 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 to handle the operation and maintenance, but also gives them an incentive to make sure that they get something valuable at the end of the day. So in this case, actually, we had a municipality and a private sector which uh, 
who were engaged through a public-private partnership. This was arranged and facilitated through the project. Uh, the municipality brought land and also is providing institutional support in terms of access to waste. And we also have a private company, a private company in charge of uh, the operation, maintenance of the facility, but also in charge of the marketing of the compost that was to be produced in this case. And then research organizations, a certain number of them, provided all the technical inputs, uh, the support for you know, uh, the marketing and so on, the know-how actually to make this model work. And then we had also a donor who provided financial support, not only to the researchers, but also to the capital uh, investment that was required in this case. Let me elaborate further what happened. So once the treatment plan was constructed, we linked with a certain number of stakeholders, especially the private truck operators who are in charge of the waste management. So they, they bring, we make sure by linking up with them that they bring the waste into the treatment facilities. And within the treatment facilities, the, the waste is being converted into a compost. And the formulation of that compost was made in collaboration with the farmers. So listening to them and understanding what their needs are, the product, the compost was formulated and reached in some cases, to make sure that it addresses the demand of the farmers on the ground. And this kind of treatment facility not only treats the waste, but also allows to generate something that is of great value. So here we are treating 15,000 cubic meters per year of fecal sludge, in addition to some municipal solid waste, organic fractions, actually it's food waste mostly. And this is generating a compost that can be used to, fa to, to be applied um, over 100 hectares per year. And the yields are, in that case, increased by 20 to 50 percent, which is a great input. And I have to mention that this, in Ghana, for instance, and in many sub-Saharan Africa, the access to fertilizers is extremely limited, extremely difficult. The average use of fertilizer presently is around 10 kilograms per hectare, so very, very low, and mostly for cash crops. So in this case, being able to generate um, an input that can be locally produced, that allows you know, the treatment to also be done at the same time is a real benefit. And as part of the process also, we had the opportunity to link up with the Ministry of Food and Agriculture, who delivered a certificate to enable this facility to sell the compost um, to the farmers. So the certificate actually certified not only the quality uh, the, the, I would say the quality, the safety aspect of the compost, but also looked at uh, the effectiveness upon application of the compost uh, in the farms. Um, and good news with this is that we have a continuous flow of money in this system. So this shows how the money flows in the entire chain. So we have money that is continuously coming into the treatment facility. And upon break-even, which is expected to be after three years, uh, the profits is going to be shared between the municipality and also the, the private entity. And the share that is going to the municipality is going to be reinvested into all kinds of projects that can benefit the entire community. And also this results in jobs that are being created and improving the livelihoods of people in the community. So this brings several outcomes, uh, implementing the resource recovery and reuse. So you improve the health, you improve the livelihoods, but you also improve the nutrition if you increase the availability of great food in the area. And one thing I will mention before concluding is that this was a great opportunity, implementing this project was really a great opportunity to build capacity and to share knowledge, build capacity of the public sector who was not necessarily before exposed and familiar with um, all these kind of resource recovery and reuse, but also of the private sector. Uh, so that was a great opportunity. And this photo shows engagement also with the farmers who were part of the elaboration of the product. And just uh, as, uh, to conclude, I would say that uh, you can anytime refer to these outputs, what we call the resource recovery and reuse series of applied research. So these are outlets, uh, reports that we make available, that we publish on a regular basis, and that in form of some 
form of these initiatives, resource recovery and reuse, the opportunities that exist, and you know how to address some of the challenges that we see and have seen on the ground. So you can easily access these documents from the website of the organization, International Water Management Institute, and they are available for free uh, directly on the website. On this, I would like to thank you very much for your kind attention.